Hey, happy Halloween, everybody. It's Cowork's the Great, the visual storytelling show recorded live at the Ann Arbor District Library on the corner of 5th and William Lovely <laughs> <laughs> we are the original Ghostbusters, Spencer, Tracy, and Kong. <laughs> and your host, Dr. Zayas. All right, I'm done. I just wanted to say No, no, that'd be General Urko. General Urko, yeah, yeah. 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 Can, can you guys even hear me with this? Uh, Not well, no. Yeah, no okay, so. I, I think it's much better that way. <laughs> All right, let's switch back. So it is a Halloween. Ah! Oh, oh no, it's really he would have gotten away with it too if it wasn't for our <laughs> this the, the meddling kids. So this show is recorded every other Wednesday at the Ann Arbor District Library Netcast Studio in lovely downtown Ann Arbor, Michigan, on the fifth uh, corner of Fifth and William. Uh, comics.adl.org. This is the show where we talk about comics, uh, how to make comics, what goes into the the comics lifestyle, all the things that surround this medium that we love so much. And my name is Jersey Droz, cartoonist and teaching artist. Over there. I am Paul Story, uh, comic book writer and occasional writer of prose. And then, so yeah, Paul, you're returning to the show. For those I who am. are new to the show, this guy's on here a lot. So if you don't like this one, don't go D back into the archives. Yeah, don't look in the archives. <laughs> uh, <laughs> nice, nice Halloween theme. <laughs> don't check the archives. Well, I try to use reverse psychology here. You know, Mama's Rule, you put it on the high shelf and the kids actually want it. Don't watch the archives. So at youtube.com slash comics are great, by the way. So then over there, we have another guy returning to the show. Hey, I'm Dave Carter. I'm a librarian at the University of Michigan where I select comics and video games and all sorts of other cool stuff. Wow, you guys got that just the upbeat or up tempo rhythm going on today. It is Halloween, the best day of the year. <laughs> and, <laughs> My and, favorite holiday. And and uh, Dave, you also manage the uh, video game library yes. at the he, University he of Michigan. Did say that. You did say that. I did okay, say that. I just want to make sure that we underline that with black crayon because that is a really really cool and job. And maybe some orange crayon to go with it. <laughs> black and orange <laughs> crayon. And then I turn to the Skypes, and we have a special guest today. Somebody who I've been meaning to talk to for about I guess about going on three years now. Uh, the artist of one of my favorite comics on the internet, uh, John David Guerra. Oh God, I can never say that R, that roll that R right. Guerra's fine if you can't roll your R's. Guerra. <laughs> See, I can sort of do it, but uh, John Guerra. David Guerra of of NightmareProWrestling.com, and I'll give a quick introduction to this comic if you haven't heard it. I mean, today's the day to read it. Because it's Halloween, right? And it's scary good. Oh. Oh. But, oh my gosh, we turned into the Muppet Show. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Disney's going to buy us any second. Uh, <laughs> let's not even go there. So, Nightmare Pro Wrestling, what's it about, John? I mean, you've, you've done conventions. You've done this pitch before. Yeah, uh, it's about uh, pro wrestling monsters competing to become the Nightmare Pro Wrestling champion. And... Uh, the main story follows a young monster named Grave and his uh, tag team partner named Lobo, who's a cowardly werewolf, as they have fun and they try to hone their wrestling skills. And your art style is some of the most fun stuff to look at in the entire world. And I admitted this publicly that when I was going through those He-Man redesigns on my website uh, a year ago, it was partially inspired by your work on Nightmare Pro Wrestling and also the work of uh, Luis Escobar and in the uh, film that he was working on at the time. Oh, thanks. Uh, yeah. But it's just so dynamic and energetic, <laughs> and, and your pages are really, really fun to look at. Matt, is there any chance we can pull up John's page that I, I sent to you to uh, I can show the audience? Oh, oh look at that. that. It's right next to me on the screen. John, you can't see this, but the audience at home can see uh, to my, you know, to my right, to your left. Um, Look at this page and look at how he uses like non-traditional reading flow to like guide our eye from panel one to panel two. Then panel two zigs down. Oh, I should point the other way. Zigs down across that table. Uh, I'm looking at the latest page on your site, John. And then oh. like and panel three is sort of like an inset watching oh. what's happening on the table in, in panel four. Are you still there, John? Oh, oh John froze. He froze for a second. Let's see if we can get him back. But what a great expression. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Yeah, I'm so okay. Oh, are you there, John? <laughs> Yeah, I'm here. Okay. okay. <laughs> Great. So anyway, yeah, it's like it's both it's got a fun energetic style and he does really really cool stuff on the page and uh, some of the, the desktop images that you got on there uh, that you were posting recently on Google Plus were super super fun to look at. So anyway, I'm a big fan of your work and I'm really glad that you could be part of the show today. Oh, thank you. So Topic time. We introduced everybody. Topic time. Yeah. Uh, I don't know <laughs> where that came from. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you know, Halloween. 
scary stories, horror stories, uh, and being to warm us up to get into this, I thought it would be fun to like do as a thinking exercise is to reminisce on this is Halloween, this is the day where you know uh, several decades ago guys like us would have gone out on the streets in a costume and and hit people up for candy, right? Uh, yeah. <laughs> on the street, going house to house. <laughs> Nowadays, you have to go to a mall or you yeah. have to go to a library. They had, they had uh, trick or treating the in the library. library today, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and you well, do I it still before. do it, but I get weird looks. <laughs> <laughs> do you really? Because I was going to ask. That was my first question: Is what was the age that you guys all were when you stopped trick or treating? When were you too old? <sighs> it was I'm thinking fifteen around, and then I went up through. I mean, longer than I should have. Yeah, I'm sure because you know candy. Yeah. But yeah. <laughs> But also dressing up. And oh yeah, you always oh, have yeah. to dress. You, no, well, the, you're, the you're kids go around you're without dressing find, like, up. Like a younger sibling no. to take with you and just make, use that as an excuse. Oh yeah, or, or just get some kid from the neighborhood. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah Mrs. Robinson, I'll take your kids out trick or treat. <laughs> uh, no, you got me a little alarmed. What happened after the trick or treating, <laughs> Mrs. Robinson? All right, hold up. <laughs> so, Paul, I, how I, old were you? I think about thirteen, maybe thirteen. Um, yeah, about I, I think about that. You know, supposedly that's the age you're supposed to transition into Halloween parties. Mm -hmm. You know, more kind of. But you got to get invited to the parties first, Paul. I know. Oh. That's why I never <laughs> went to any. <laughs> but thanks for stomping on my joke. <laughs> <laughs> I was right there with you, bro. I mean, I was sitting at home reading Werewolf by <laughs> Night by myself with a single finger. <laughs> Jersey and I are like, oh, I wonder what people are doing tonight that aren't sitting at home. Watching It's the Great Pumpkin, Charlie Brown. <laughs> yeah. So, John, what what uh, age were you when you when you gave it up? When um, you hung, hung the cowl. I don't know. Uh, I wouldn't say like five years ago, probably. Really? Yeah. Yeah. So like, when you were fifteen, uh, in, in, the, in the the neighborhood where I grew up, there's still people that go out trick or treating, wow. and uh, I would just go with like younger siblings or you know. Yeah. Uh, Younger cousins or something like that. Okay. Yeah, that, yeah. that always helps when you do have younger relatives. I, I, I think I went trick-or-treating as recently as 2001. Uh, I would have been in my 20s or something. Uh, and it was because I had young cousins to yeah. take out. I, so. I think yeah. I need to, <laughs> need to develop a, uh, like a, a uh, trick-or-treat bot. That looks like a little kid. Yeah, <laughs> it's part of your costume. <laughs> you know, part of your costume is this little fake so kind of just, puppet yeah. thing. Like, no, look, I got a kid with me. Okay, but then next question: best costume that you ever wore? Favorite costume? And I mean, and Cooper costumes are included in the mix. It doesn't have to be something that you made by hand. So, see, all my good costumes were post, yeah, uh, trick or treating. I mean, oh, they were when yeah. you were partying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So uh, you, you dressed as a sexy witch, and uh, uh, <laughs> actually, my my probably my favorite costume of all time. Although I've I've had a couple that I, I really like. My favorite was probably my Captain America costume. Uh, yeah. Oh, nice! It was. Uh, <laughs> I was really I I was really happy with it, and I did learn why you need. Uh, you know, everybody makes fun of people uh, superheroes wearing their shorts on the outside. Mm -hmm. Has never worn a, a leotard. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You need. Trunks over <laughs> the leotard. For, for the good of humanity. For the good yeah. of humanity. Yeah. Unless so, you're very outgoing. Uh, <laughs> so, okay, well, now we know. And we also should say, like, that's something we don't get to talk about enough on the show, is that Paul <laughs> is a Captain America scholar. You're both a Robin Hood scholar and a Captain America scholar. I, well, I, I, I would say aficionado. I mean, scholar puts me into a, a rare... F I know some, some actual, like, Robin Hood scholars, yeah. and they would put me to shame. Oh, you know, okay. I'd be so, like, I was a super so Captain yep. America geek then? I no a Captain. I'll go with. Oh, a here we go. I, I, I go with aficionado. <laughs> I, <laughs> Show but, over, God, uh, Paul. You and your semantics. By, by the way, you've got uh, gorilla fur in your uh, beard. In, in my in my flesh beard. Yeah. yeah. Oh well, that's so that's it's, it's part of the costume. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, Dave, what what about your favorite? So yeah, bag? I went to a. It was a superhero themed Halloween yeah? Halloween party, and I went as Clark Kent. Oh. I had the blue suit on and the thing, and then I had the Superman shirt on underneath the nice. underneath the stuff, and then occasionally would take off the glasses and open up the shirt and where'd Clark go? <laughs> that sort of thing. So nice. That went well. But did you get the uh, the Clark Kent black rimmed glasses, or just wear? No, I just wore because these are like prescriptions, so you know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I wanted to be able to see during the party as well. <laughs> this is something and I want to give a plug, a shout out, and God, we are going to talk about comics. I swear to God, everybody. We should probably also, you know. 
We're gonna get John. Yeah, yeah, but but it's just but talking about Clark Kent is that I uh, D- Dave Roman and I did a couple episodes of the Saturday Supercast, which we only do like once a year. Uh, episodes twenty nine and thirty at sugarycereals dot com. And one of the things we talked about was I never even thought of this. Cause I only started wearing glasses in the last couple of years. But when you're a kid and you're wearing glasses, there's only so many things you can be for Halloween, right? Yeah. And like I'm a zombie with glasses. <laughs> I'm a ghost with, with glasses. glasses. <laughs> kinda, I never thought of that, but it does kind of d- diffuse the whole thing. So now, John, we'll close out this discussion on Halloween. Costumes by asking, what was one of your favorites? If you only stopped five years ago, you got a lot of costumes in your yeah. back catalog. Um, well, Halloween's always been like really big in my family, and like every year we have like a a big like Halloween party, and our family like does like props and everything. Wow. And uh, I think my favorite costume was like two years ago. I was like a an evil magician, but <laughs> like my costume wasn't too extravagant. But I had like these props, like I had like a severed rabbit's head in my top so hat. So an evil stage magician. Okay. Yeah, there we go. Right. Evil right. stage magician. <laughs> nice. Not not like an evil comic book wizard kind of. Well, they, yeah, that's yeah. I was. I, I yeah. thought that was probably where he's going, but I wanted to make sure. So like an ev- evil uh, David is it David Blaine? Is that his name? Uh, I, I, I that is one of the yeah uh, like yeah. Sta- yeah those those kinds of magicians but I, illusionist I, I, did you well, have a well, top I, I hat had a, I had like a magician suit on you know like with the tails and stuff so you, David oh, Blaine just yeah. usually like t shirt and jeans I, I the think. really the really traditional you know yeah. stage magician the, the, the Zatara of the yeah there you go ah, there you go there we go bring it back to the comics, comics yes. types and everything yeah so okay so that that's so you actually make your costumes you don't go out and get the the, the, right. the pre-made, out-of-the-box, yeah. plastic right. smock yeah. thing. We will pick up a few things that we need, you know, bought, but usually make our own costumes. Yeah. So, yeah. so we, were, we were talking briefly before we started recording about Cooper masks. I don't know if anybody had any thoughts on that they wanted to share with, like, the, what the kids are missing out on these years. Because I was at Target recently. <laughs> They're really, the- really awful molded, uh, you know, because they, they, like, Spider-Man was okay because it's faceless. But, like, I remember seeing, like, girls getting stuck in a Wonder Woman mask. Or, like, the Cinderella and, mask. Yeah, it looks it like her death mask. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it, re- it, it reminds you of why they were able to turn the, uh, the, the failed Captain Kirk mask into Michael Myers. Oh, you know, that's it's like, right. There's just not enough definition to the features. And it's like, oh, oh, that's so funny. That's and so creepy. And the Ben Cooper mask had that just tiny little, tiny little oval in, which, in which, the lips. Which would always snap a little bit and cut your lip. Yeah. Right? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. But I, I had the, I had the, the pleasure of, of introducing a 17-year-old to Cooper masks. She had never heard of them. She didn't know what I was talking about. And so I'm like, well, the mask was made out of this really cheap plastic. She's like, oh, so it was like 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 rubber or something? I'm like, no, it was like this really hard plastic. She's like, you mean it was like silicone or something? I'm like, no, this is before all that stuff. We didn't have <laughs> materials that nice. And I, I, I heard it, myself sounding really old. Yeah. But <laughs> it's, like, <laughs> it's like if you took the packaging that like all your blister package that's yeah, what I, yeah. and then like shave it down by half so there's no actual rigidity to it <laughs> and then make it white with you know some some bad paint over it right that's a ben cooper mask but there was something magical about going to the store and seeing all those rows of boxes with those faces staring up back at yep, you out yep. of the boxes so you know what am i gonna be and it's like a hundred thousand different things there i could be the flintstones yeah i could be the flintstones <laughs> i could be frankenstein i could be captain kirk i could be yeah and, and i could i could be the the spider which is not spider-man <laughs> The green and white one that that uh, Steve Miller band uh, Steve Miller wore the 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 spider mask on the cover of uh, on the album cover for Joker. I don't I even know what you're talking. Oh, about. Oh, you don't? No. I oh, mean, you should look it up. Uh, I, I, it's I, it's we, like this. It real. It's this like green and white mask with some web and stuff on it. And I don't even know what it was supposed to be. I just know that I ended up getting it because my parents didn't get me Spider Man. <laughs> uh, oh, I'm seeing it now. Yeah, yeah, and it's actually like a spider, isn't it? Is is this sort of sort of? Sorta. Yeah. So I mean, nobody can see it on screen, but anyway. And, uh, I, and I can't see. It. No, that's 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 not, not it. it. Well, no. Eric Closter anyway. in the chat will will no doubt uh, track it down so. for us, and it'll be in the show notes after the recording. So okay, so you know we got to get to actual topic. We're going to talk about scary stories. It's Halloween after all. And it's an opportunity to talk about what makes a story scary. Um, now we had, uh, you know, how about this, Matt? We were talk, we were debating on whether or not we were going to play this R.L. Stein video on the show, but you know, YouTube's bots might come through and say like, "Hey, that's copyrighted material. I'm going to take this video down." That would make me very sad. So we'll just link to it in the show notes. But there's a great video uh, with R.L. Stein talking about what makes a scary story. It's a commercial for his new book, but it's on YouTube. Um, 
But uh, you guys, I wonder if I could, you guys can open up the salvo on what is it, like inciting examples of some of your favorite scary, scary stories. It doesn't have to be a comic. But what is it? What do you think has to go into making something frightening? Uh, I'm guessing disembowelment, right? It's got to just be, <laughs> you got to tear out somebody's guts and spread them all over the walls. And, you know, disembowelment, defenestration, decapitation. Defenestration. The <laughs> well, <laughs> throw, that, that means throw them out the window, kids, for those, yes. for those who aren't as well read as Paul. <laughs> Or old. <laughs> yeah. but, so I haven't but, yeah. gotten there in your vocabulary list yet. Yeah, but uh, so, no, I mean, seriously, it, 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 some people think that uh, scary means gore, right? And, and well, you know, the funny thing, though, is, is that even gore, for the most part, uh, there's, there's two elements, really, that make things scary. Um, suspense mm-hmm. and surprise, which people often confuse the two. Um, suspense is sort of this building of anticipation where it's it's that moment where in in the movies or uh, or any story you know the person is walking through the house and certain that there's something horrible there but not finding it mm-hmm. and the tension is just building and building and building and building and th- which is different than surprise which is sort of like you know you turn the page or turn the corner or whatever and all of a sudden something pops out at you and right. you're like ah um and that's you know suspense often ends with surprise, but, like, often people will confuse the two. They just want to, like, throw shock after shock after Jump shock. Jump scare. Yeah. Right? Yeah. 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 That, that, that old, that old gag of looking in the mirror and then the guy's behind him, right? Yeah. That kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, but uh, th- those are those are two key elements, I think, when you're when you're trying to make something scary, is, is you want the reader waiting. I think uh, yeah. atmosphere also plays, like, a big part in it. Yeah. What like, do you mean by uh, atmosphere? Giving the, like, that kind of, like, creepy kind of vibe kind of mood like like even like uh of course bringing it back to comics i mean i'm sure jersey's happy with that (laughs) uh like there's a some horror manga that you know it's like your typical manga illustrations that you see and then uh when it starts getting to the more horror elements there's like these grotesque details like added to the characters and added to like the visuals of like the the horror aspects and uh, the same thing with like uh, like movies, you know, like uh, it's that tone. Well, I know not all those movies like have like certain like uh, that great atmosphere, but I'm more of a fan of that kind of like horror, like that atmospheric kind of horror. Like um, uh, a recent movie that came out that that has a lot of that, I think, is uh, uh, the Woman in Black with mm-hmm. Daniel Radcliffe. I've not seen that. No, I, I've it, just seen the ads and stuff for it, but yeah, it's got that. It's, it's very like Victorian and very like dark where most of the lighting is just like uh, him holding up a candle, you know? Yeah. So the anticipation of something popping out of the shadows is like there and you're like, oh, it's coming, it's coming. And it never comes, you know? <laughs> Yeah. And, uh, what about what about isolation then? Because it sounds like both of you guys are talking about isolation as well. And I think of like in all of the, it's like a trope uh, that gets used in a lot of these scary stories. Like let's split up. Let's uh, let's all go look <laughs> in different corners of this big scary yeah. house. Yes. Uh, yes. But, you know, hey, Velma and <laughs> yeah, Velma and Shaggy. Daphne and I are going to go yeah. here. Well, Scooby, you and Shaggy go yes. down to the basement. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We're going over to this room to make out while you guys are yeah. there. They actually did a Cartoon Network uh, uh, parody uh, video where they got the original voice cast together. And uh-huh. like they're like, let's split up. And like Shaggy's like, oh, Daphne. Or Daphne says, oh, I'll go with Shaggy and Scooby. And then Fred, Freddy goes up to her and he's like, Daphne? And he starts to add you. And she's like, oh, that's right. I'll go with Fred. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway. Uh, but no, but they do this, right? And I think about, um, I was, as, I was, as I was thinking about this topic in the morning, I was thinking about uh, a game that, like, the only scary game I've ever played was Resident Evil. Like, uh, the Resident Evil series. I played up to, I think, three. Um, and part of what made that game so fun and so He means scary. levels, by the way, not actually. <laughs> levels. It's not levels in that game. It's a newer game, Paul. There, there, there's no leaderboard and there's no stage uh, w- World 1-1 one, one anymore. <laughs> I have no idea what that means. <laughs> Where do I put the tokens in this thing? I don't know. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm making it bad. Uh, yes. and, uh, <laughs> her ball smash. You gotta wear the gorilla mask when you do that. Uh, but anyway, the, the game was is that I mean you're alone. You're alone in this creepy police station with all this really eerie art that has disturbing messages that you have to decode and everything. And that's what made the game so fun. It wasn't the zombie killing. 
Because there aren't that many zombies in like the beginning of the game. You, once you get through the, like the, the initial zombie horde and get into the police station, you're just alone with this creepy piano music for like a long time. And that's what made the game so fun. Was I, I'm just wondering like what role does isolation play in making a scary story? Well, yeah, what, I mean, uh, it's yeah, I mean, sure. it's sort of the the helplessness of it. I'm into stuff like you know existential angst, you know. <laughs> You know, the H.P. Lovecraft stuff where, you know, you realize that, you know, there are these oppressive forces in the universe that are going to come down and, you know, like, devour us or take us over or whatever like that. Or loss of control, I think, is another thing that go to horror, like, you know, invasion of the body snatchers or something yeah. like that. Oh, yeah. Well, and, and actually, the in, in certain respects, the, uh, like, the werewolf myth is about personal loss of control. Right, right. Um, although, like, some of the traditional stuff, people were, um, it was less of a curse and more... Like something that people took on themselves, uh, you know, they would. Uh, uh, but but that idea of um, we're frightened by the savagery within us. Right, yeah, um, the Doctor Jekyll sort of. Yeah, sort of thing. yeah, Doctor Jekyll, Mister Hyde, the Hulk. Uh, um, that idea that in inside of us there is a monster. Right. Um, and that's that's also. Uh, or that our our secret inner life will be exposed to the world. Yeah. Kind of yeah. Thing. I think it's interesting. You're talking about Lovecraft because. Lovecraft had a, a great way of making us feel not not just isolated as individuals, but isolated as a race. Right. right. I mean, it's like, oh, humanity is so insignificant. Right. Right. That even you know, even if there's a hundred of you, it it you're alone. Um, so I think that uh, you know that that is that isolation, that sense of uh, being cut off from support. Uh, yeah. I think it's also like uh, go watch a scary movie with your friends and it's not that scary. But if you're home alone <laughs> and you put on a scary movie, it's just a little bit scarier. You know, that's true. Yeah. That's yeah. true. I mean, even even listening to scary stories, I was I was working in my basement studio by myself one one afternoon. It was winter, too. So it was like dark at like five o'clock and it's getting dark in there. And I'm listening to the Horror Etc. podcast. I don't know if you guys listen to that. Uh, yeah, it, I listen to that. Yeah. That's a good show. And they were talking about uh, Japanese horror films, and which I have not watched much of because I saw like the first 20 minutes of The Ring. By the way, playing on a TV in a barber shop. Who does that? <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've got a guy cutting my hair. He's got sharp things around my head. He's got The Ring playing in front of me, right? And he's like, you know, if you watch this, <laughs> you're going to be dead. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, that's a whole other thing. But uh, so, but so. Sorry I, about your ear. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so I haven't watched much of it. But just listening to them talk about like the way all these little ghost children get involved in these stories, and then all of a sudden, like my cat knocks something over at the other side of the st the, the basement street. I'm like, ah, ah, you know. So yeah, <laughs> being by yourself does accentuate the scariness. Yeah. Of the I, I, you know, I actually remember I, I was on a. a car ride uh, back from Florida. Vis I was visiting family, and it was really, really early in the morning, mm -hmm. dark, and I, there, there was uh, whatever song was playing had some mention of the devil in it. Mm -hmm. And I guess I was still a little tired, a little punchy, and I couldn't bring myself to look in my... I, for no reason, could not bring myself to look in my rearview mirror. Because <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I'm going to look up, and there's going to be someone or something. And in it's going to be John Lovitz with that devil costume <laughs> on. <Hey! laughs> <laughs> Which would be pretty scary, yeah. actually. <laughs> and he's not like, I haven't worked in a while. <laughs> so what's the difference? I'm curious what you guys think about this. What's the difference between frightening and disturbing? Or is there a difference between those things? I think disturbing creeps up on you. you it's more of a, or you gradually realize that something is wrong, as opposed to frightening, which you suddenly realize something is wrong. Mm. Mm. Um, I'll, I'll go with, I mean, one of my favorite horror comics ever is Black Hole by Charles Burns, where it mm. starts out as this, you know, 70s suburbia sort of thing, and then gradually you as a reader realize and the kids in the comic realize that something is wrong here. People mm. are cha people are changing and the changes are slow to start out with. You know, somebody's like growing an extra finger or, or a little tail or something like that. Yeah. And then as you go further into it gets more and more disturbing as you as you go in. I think of I think of the the black it's been described as a black comedy uh parents. Uh, have you guys seen that? Uh, uh, with um 
Randy Quaid uh, about the kid who finds out that his parents are cannibals. It's I like was going to say, that'd be disturbing right there. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's, Having it's, Randy Quaid as a parent. It, it is Randy Quaid, yeah. Yeah, yeah it probably. is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, and it, it, it's like a 50s suburbia film about this okay. little boy, and there's just something off about his parents. He can't put his finger on it, and then it's the slow realization where they're hinting that they're, they're doing something really bad with meat. You know, and 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 you know, like halfway through, you're like, wait a second, those are people, aren't they? No, they're not going to go there. And then they, they go, go there. there, and then yeah. So like, there's this this looming. It's almost like it's kind of a company with dread, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Like I think about yeah. um, the the movies, The Omen, with uh, mm-hmm. you know, like the original Omen, and I tried watching that with my wife. And she couldn't take it. And I'm like, what, is it too scary? She's like, no, it's too dreadful. It's like, I know this isn't going to end well, you know? And, <laughs> and watching Gregory Peck, handsome Gregory Peck, slowly fall into this abyss is not my idea of entertainment, right? Yeah. Uh, and that's different than just, like, shock horror, isn't yeah. it? Well, I, I think it's interesting, too, uh, that um, we, we often will call stuff horror because it's got monsters in it, mm-hmm. and it's not necessarily. Okay. Um, you know... Buffy the Vampire Slayer, for example, gets labeled as horror, and there's some horrific elements, but it's really an action adventure. I mean, she's killing monsters. Mm-hmm. Um, for the most part, a true horror story ends horribly. <laughs> it's not, you know, like, oh, horrible things happen, uh, 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 and I walk away and everything's, you know, the sun's coming up and we're all whistling as we, we get away. Um yeah. Yeah, all is not set right with the world at the end of the story in a horror yeah, story. Yeah, the world's been irrevocably changed for the worse. Yeah, that's so many, so many Lovecraft stories, and with just like people going crazy. Or, going, yeah, go, I haven't yeah. read Lovecraft, but I read Stephen King's The Mist, and I still yeah. haven't seen the movie, but I've read the short story that the movie's based on, and yeah, that does not end happily for <laughs> yeah. anybody yeah. involved, right? And well, I, I think that's why uh, J horror also like works a lot for me because mm-hmm. it doesn't end very happily a, a lot of the times. So it doesn't end with like Jamie Lee Curtis in a hospital bed going like, "Whoo, <laughs> glad <Yeah>. that's <laughs> over." <laughs> <laughs> well, at, at least with some of those the slasher type stuff, you only end up with like you know you have the soul survival kind of right. thing, mm-hmm. yeah. which is at least uh, uh, hor- horrific in that it ends with that isolation you were talking about. Mm-hmm. But, you know, the whole thing when, like, the Scooby gang, uh, whether the original or the Buffy Vampire Slayer version, yeah. where they, you know, oh, everything was terrifying, but mostly we came out okay. Um, it, it, then you're dealing more with, you know, you might be dealing with suspense and, and, and horrific elements, but you're you know that's that's sort of I and I don't as as a rule I don't like horror true horror that much mm. um I don't like the uh I I don't like you know I like the the triumph of the human spirit but <laughs> 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 well, you're the wrong day for that I don't <laughs> yeah. Halloween is all about overcoming darkness uh, all right all right so, so I mean y- you don't find that entertaining in its own way to end on a bad note? Um, I, I, because what, what I'm trying to drive at is I'm not trying to attack your point of view. No, what no. I'm trying to get at here is, is why do some people, why are some people attracted to that? I mean, because, okay, so because they're too happy, <laughs> <laughs> they're too self satisfied you, with you their know own what's, lives. What's weird though is I, I've still been trying to pin this down for years is that I cannot watch, like, J horror films are just too freaky to me. Uh, I can't watch. Uh, films like Saw, where it's like the, the the gore is right there and the human suffering is really yeah, apparent. I can't watch those either. Yeah. Uh, no, like no. <laughs> even the movie Titanic, where all those people are dying, that was too much for me. It was like there's too much human suffering going on on the screen right now, and I was covering my eyes when the boat was sinking and everything. And, and it wasn't the Leo and Kate thing that was bothering me. It was watching all these poor people falling to their deaths that I just couldn't take. But for some reason, like things like Carpenter films, John Carpenter films, I eat that stuff like poi like the fog is great <laughs> and and it ends badly and then i think of the prince of darkness ends badly uh and and i i don't know there's something kind of haunting and it sticks with you right uh i don't know can anybody speak to this is like what, what's the attraction there about ending on a bad note i think it's that that fun aspect like you say john carpenter i love this stuff too and it's it's just like a lot of fun it's almost like that like that uh when you're a kid, kind of like that uh, spooky adventure sort of thing, you know? Like that spooky mystery adventure sort of thing going. Oh. Like, I, I, I guess, guess, yeah, like in the case of Prince of Darkness, the case I've made for why I like it so much is that it's the it's like mythological battles in a, in a horror setting, mm-hmm. right? It's, it's 
uh, God versus anti God, and like they use like quantum physics to like in tachyons to explain some of the stuff that's going on. And then you got Alice Cooper as a zombie, so it's like, oh, everything about <laughs> this is terrific. But it's not so much about like, oh, there's a curse on a child that was killed in a brutal way, and now if you watch this TV show, you're gonna pull yourself inside out or anything like that. It's also a safe way to experience those emotions mm-hmm. because you know because mm-hmm. you know it's a story. Unlike if you were to like, I mean, actual real world horror. No, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> you but you don't want to have to go through life chopping heads off of stuff. <laughs> no, no, you know, <laughs> or you know, you know, truly horrible things happen to people every day in the in the real True. world, yes. um, and you don't want to actually experience that. Yeah. But when you experience it in a fictional uh, setting, and you can s- sort of get those feelings out without having to actually go through that, I think yeah. there's a catharsis involved. Yeah, in, in that. So, Paul, you're not a fan of, like, the Soylent Green, uh, I, 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 Planet of the Apes. By the way, Planet of the Apes doesn't end so good, the first one. Just I, I've <laughs> watched it. <laughs> okay. um, I don't, well, but I, I again, that has a, a, a horrific element to it, but I wouldn't call it a horror film. What about Soylent Green? Soylent Green is... I actually never seen Soylent Green. You know how it ends. I do. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, but but, it, yeah, but like, I don't see what the problem is. <laughs> <laughs> protein is protein, man. <laughs> um, that's what Randy Spoiler Quaid alert. <laughs> well, no, I think I danced around that pretty Soil well. Soil green is tofu, everybody. That's <laughs> what we're talking oh, about. Uh, <laughs> way to go, Jersey. <laughs> All right, let's talk comics. Wait, did you say tofu food? Yeah, tofu food. <laughs> oh, oh. Edward G. Robinson tofu food, as a matter of fact. Yeah. Uh, so let's talk comics. We have some comics to talk about, that, to talk specifically about these visual aspects of making a scary story. I saw you guys both brought piles. I did. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, <laughs> one moment. Comics, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and, John, feel free to, if you could think of any uh, scary comics that you've ever you know, uh, read in the past that you might want to talk about on the show or web comics that matter. Or Nightmare Pro Wrestling, you talk about how you think about <laughs> writing like the more scary, dangerous elements of that. But we'll we'll start with Paul. One of the most terrifying. I brought uh, one of the most terrifying story arcs that I experienced. I, I think I was like eleven or twelve mm-hmm. when I read this. Is in Werewolf by Night by Doug Mensch, Don Perlin, um, and and the guy who is cursed to be a werewolf, um, and some friends go to this horrible, horrible haunted house. Like this, this man is. Yeah, put it I, in the, yeah um, I've got to say. On the comic cam, put it in the comic cam. <laughs> there yeah. we go. There we got. Oh, they so. have, yeah, both, both work out. Um, and uh, it, just the, the story of this like despicable man and how he, he just dragged people into darkness. Mm. Um, and you know, I'm like, I'm like I say, I'm I'm twelve or eleven or twelve, and I'm just it was horrifying. And there was, uh, let me see if I can find the, uh, there's this one image that just sticks with me. Um, see, I'm, I'm not seeing any EC comics in anybody's piles. Was that just like <laughs> too much of a gimme? <laughs> that, that may be. <laughs> <laughs> where this one where this, this uh, a, a werewolf is attacking the, uh, the werewolf. It's, it turns out to be his ancestor that was the first one cursed. Mm. And... And the His psych- face is melting off. The, well, the psychic girl manages to change him back to human, and he starts talking, and then, yeah, his face basically melts off, turns into this hor- horrific skull, um, and then he just bursts into flames. And that just, like, the, the, the kind of way that they, they went, or went through that. Um, well, they're doing stuff with the pa- the ending on the end of the page, right? Yeah, like the, yeah. the the skull moment is happening on the end of the well, page. The, and the fo- funny thing though is that you know you think, oh, the skull moment—that's the most horrific part. Yeah. And then boom, you hit the top of the next page, and he like bursts into this, you know. <laughs> oh, but wait! Yeah, <laughs> we're gonna start him on fire, and then we're gonna st- st- stuff living snakes down his throat too. Uh, on oh, top of oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> but I, I mean, it was just this. Um, but okay, Paul. Question. Yes. And I know you were 12 when you read this thing, yeah. but it's drawings, dude. It's it's even more elevated than film. This isn't a real guy. It's a cartoon of a guy getting his face melted off and started on fire. Why is this so scary? What do they do? Because you, they draw you into the story. They make you care about the characters. Ah! They make you, uh, you know, <laughs> they make you interested. Uh, in this case... We didn't cover that in our earlier discussion, yeah. right? Making you care about the character's yeah. fate, too, right? So. Um, and, and the more you identify with the characters or care for the characters, it's not necessarily both, but usually both. 
mm-hmm. um, then then you're really invested in their survival. And that's one of the reasons why when people die in these films where you're you're kind of not so invested in them, mm-hmm. that they're they're like that. <laughs> gradual building up process. The, the, the chubby kid in the wheelchair on Friday the 13th who goes down the stairs and gets you're the like, harpoon through him. Yeah. You're like, oh, that's horrible. That's <laughs> right. too bad. But, but then, eventually... But when Scatman Crothers in The Shining gets it, oh my gosh, that's that's brutal, right? I don't think I've ever seen The Shining. You've not seen The Shining either? I told you I'm not big a horror fan. <laughs> I, I, I love scary elements, but I'm not a big... Like straightforward. I it took Dave till help me out here. You know uh, what I'm talking yeah, about. Yeah, I've not ahead. seen The Shining. Oh, John, <laughs> <laughs> Matt, help me out, somebody. somebody. You're all alone, <laughs> Jersey. Oh, that now talk, The Shining is a good example of a really good balance of of disturbing and horror too. Because there's that scene with all the people in the costumes at the end. <laughs> oh, the scene in the bar with the ghost bartender. <laughs> the gal in the bathtub. Blah, blah, blah. I haven't seen it since I was a kid. The, and I remember those scenes. The ghost twins. That always gets me. the girl twins. Yeah. yeah, you're going to play with us forever <laughs> and ever. Oh. Anyway, continue. Yeah. Sorry. I was just reminded, but so you, what else do you got? Oh well, and, and actually, I just brought I I brought some of my uh, my Twisted Journeys books um, that I did. It's funny because like so you've written I'm scary not, stories. I'm not that big a horror fan, but I've written all these kind of horrific things, and especially <laughs> with the uh, Twisted Journeys, they're set up as you pick your own path through the storyline. Yeah. So you end up with all these horrible endings, you know, where, (laughs) oh, you died. Oh, you you died. (laughs) Everybody around you died, you know? Um, And I was never a big fan of that sort of thing. Uh, It's one of the reasons... But do you like writing it? um, It's it's an interesting challenge uh, to to kind of write something that's not in your wheelhouse. Um, And having to imagine, like, the six ways the character can die in the story. In in this case, like, more like 30 ways. And... (laughs) um, but yeah, I, you know, and I got to I got to deal with ghosts and zombies, and then uh, the the last one, my most recent one, I had a lot of fun because um, it's it's set in the Irish Hills in an abandoned amusement park and has fairies and like Celtic folklore, which people think of, oh fairies they're cute. No, Celtic folklore is horrific. Yeah, it, you know these they're they, you know they are terrifying terrifying creatures. You know. And uh, and I had fun playing with that too. You know the, the whole, um, you know that those elements of uh, well, of course, Halloween uh, mm-hmm. comes from uh, Samhain, and, and there was the whole, or as people say, Sam Hain. Oh, uh, you know, so and it's not just the Danzig thing. No. Okay. And uh, you know, it's uh, there's very you know very strong Celtic uh, 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 mythic. Uh, overtones for the whole wearing of masks and and horrific elements and things. Okay. So, um, so that yeah, that so that was a lot of fun. And then I also what I think. Oh, my boyfriend is a monster, is which the, we talked yes, about before. I have I have talked about my boyfriend is a monster, uh, which is about a girl who falls in love with the new guy at school, and who, found out he was not so much born as assembled. Um, <laughs> and uh, but you know the. the Again, that was one of those things where uh, now this has got like paranormal romance and it's got a sense of humor to it and everything. But yeah, you have to you know find those moments that are just like oh, that's now just this, this is a whole other disturbing thing disturbing or or horrific. This yeah, this is a whole other thing that that always puzzled me as a young boy uh, when they'd come out with movies like. Bram Stoker's Dracula, and there's Monona Ryder, and she's like, "Oh, this guy is hideous. I love him," you know. <laughs> 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 and, 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 and I mean, as that nerdy little comic book boy who was the nice guy, who was who was a really good friend and all that stuff, and then the, but but this guy who really gives me a hard time, I dig him. You know, it, it always confused me as a kid. I wonder if you could, as ha- having written one of these stories, can you explain this whole phenomenon, like well, being attracted I, to the the ghoulish I, and well, I I don't know because because uh, in this instance, it's one of those times where sh- you know his his nature is hidden um and and she falls for him as as a person before she finds out that he is what we would call a monster so so that's the fear that that this thing that you like isn't really what you think it is well and that and that actually works in Bram Stop- Stoker's Dracula where you know it, she doesn't fall in love with the creepy old guy that Jonathan Harker meets at the beginning of the thing by the time, by the time Winona meets him, he's like, 
Mr. Slick, you know, Victorian guy with his purple sun tinted sunglasses. <laughs> yeah, it's still Gary Oldman, you know. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you know, I know I know a lot of women who have a thing for Gary Oldman. <laughs> I'm just I'm just kidding. He was so, awesome as Commissioner Gordon. It was I, the best part of those movies, as a matter of fact. But <laughs> Uh, no, but but it, uh, isn't it also like I'm, I'm it, guessing it's like the whole well, there's more to this than meets the eye. Whereas like yes, the, the, the Keanu Reeves character, it's like he's he's you know uh, he's what he is. He's what he is. Right. I, I, I often, cover. by the way, I have to throw trot this one out. I often say that Keanu Reeves gave a performance so wooden they could have driven him through the vampire's heart. <laughs> Hey! <laughs> <laughs> for, like for those listening to the audio podcast afterwards, there was a gesture that went in there, yeah. like yeah, cha cha. <laughs> we'll be no. here all week. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but but isn't that part of the point of that character? I mean, wasn't Keanu just doing like a tour de force of playing a guy who is like the uninteresting? Uh, hey, hey, Jonathan parable? Harker does not have to be that uh, uninteresting. I mean, there's a difference between you know, there's a difference between being you know <laughs> normal or. Or even a little dull, and just being like, "There's no there there." Uh, well, okay. Well, then let's let's turn to Dave. I want to hear hey. some, some of your yeah. comics. So, so I so I brought some stuff. I did. I put together this huge pile this morning, and then realized I'd have to carry them walking across half an hour. So I left most yeah. of them at home. There, there's uh, a trail of comics. <laughs> 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 um, so I I uh, I love Richard Salas stuff, and I don't know if the camera can pick that up. There we go. There we go. Yeah. yeah. Um, he d- he does a lot of different things. Mostly, it's kind of the gothic sort sort of tinged end of stuff. Um, Peculia is one of his recurring characters who comes um, in, in in several of his stories. She's kind of a a more gothy Nancy Drew type. Um, mm. She sort of but she sort of wanders into these situations and has to like get herself out by using her wits, uh, kind of thing. So there's usually a chase scene in a Peculia story where she's being chased through a, a house or something like that by monsters of various sorts. But there, there's not a l- I wouldn't call these horror things as much as, you know, sort of picking up horror tropes like monsters and vampires and things like uh, that. Yeah. Um, it's, it's definitely for an a older audience, mm-hmm. uh, teenage, teenagers or, or above sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, his, uh, I love his art uh, style and stuff. It's very... Um, well, kind of, he, uses Ed, bl- he uses Edwin black Gorey. and whites. Edward Gorey? Kind of yeah, there's a little bit yeah. of that influence. A little bit of Gorey in there, yeah. yeah. But the good kind of Gorey. Yes. Yeah, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so I also brought along uh, Zombies Calling by Faith Aaron Hicks, uh, which is a, is a story about a zombie outbreak happens at this Canadian college, but the characters them that have actually seen zombie movies, so they like sort of know what the rules are for dealing with zombies, and, and they're able to, they find out that they have like super cool like zombie killing powers because they think they should. <laughs> um, and she's using right. a sp- spork here on the cover to, you know, to, take, to decapitate one of the zombies and, and stuff. And it's Faith Aaron Hicks, and she's another you know, wonderful, wonderful cartoon. We, well, we had Faith Aaron Hicks on the uh, show. Not too yeah, oh, Faith great, Aaron Hicks great. has been yeah. on the show before. That's right. Uh, and uh, I'm noticing also that both Faith's book and what's the other fellow's name? Richard Sala. Yeah. <laughs> Richard Sala. I have not seen this guy's work before. Oh, both man. of these are in black and white. Now, I'm wondering if and that's... Actually, so is, uh, so is My Boyfriend is a Monster. Yeah, why? Yeah, but why not do them in color? Um, other than... Other than well, Atmosphere. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Even John a, John can, a nod. It's not that you can't do good horror comics in, in yeah. color, but you do get that stark black and white contrast. You can use the inks, you know, really darken up a page or lighten up yeah. a page, depending on what you want to get out of it. Yeah, and, and the interesting thing is, I think sometimes there's an element of, you know, just a horrible bring real world into it that, you know, at some point it's, Oh well, it is cheaper to do black and white. Sure, sure. But horror <laughs> so lends itself because you do have that stark contrast. You do have that atmosphere you, that that can be made with black and white. Um, the that uh, I, I think that sometimes uh, sometimes color will um, sort of dull the starkness of uh, of the imagery. Uh, uh, so, so conversely, one of my favorite uh, horror comics is Beast of Burden by Evan Dorkin and Jill Thompson, which is full watercolor painted mm-hmm. stuff. Have you guys, are you guys familiar I've with that? I've seen a little it's, bit, yeah. It's the one with the, an, with, the, with the dogs and the cats of the neighborhood who are protecting the neighborhood from the supernatural forces. And it's very, like I said, watercolors and realistic. And you get that contrast of these pastoral scenes and stuff like that with the horror that's existing underneath mm-hmm. uh, the, the story and and so the contrast of what sort of stories are being told compared to what the art is being used sort of ramp 
in certain cases, ramps up that sense of dread. Yeah. Things yeah. are going on. Uh, John, uh, I'm curious. Are you thinking about this? Sorry about that. Oh, no problem. Uh, I'm curious if, if this is something you're thinking about when you're designing your pages for Nightmare Pro Wrestling, because now well, I wouldn't call it necessarily a horror comic. It, it plays with the you know visual like, titillation of scary monsters and action. But is this something where you think about like, oh, this scene needs to be like dialed back in terms of like saturation or anything like that? Uh, yeah, uh, actually, I, I try to keep it all like. Um, well, uh, I don't know if you've noticed, but like everything that happens inside the wrestling ring, I tend to use like warmer colors. Like hmm. the backgrounds are all orange. There's like an orange tint to like everything. Yeah. Uh, inside the castle, uh, I try to make it like a little bit more spooky. Oh, and for those who don't know, like uh, the arena is like inside the castle and the castle's like on a giant tortoise. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. God, that's a great uh, book. Uh, <laughs> inside the castle, I try to make everything like green. Yeah. So to kind of give it like more of a spooky kind of like feel to it, so everything has like a a green kind of atmosphere. And um, but in the ring, everything is the amplified personas of wrestlers, right? It's like it's like when Hulk Hogan turns himself on. Like Hulk Hogan doesn't talk like that all the time, right? He's not like, "What are right. you gonna do when my pasta maniacs go wild all over you?" or Whatever. <laughs> uh, you don't know that. <laughs> no, I've watched Hogan knows best. I've seen. Uh, <laughs> It's actually a pretty funny show, but it, 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 I've seen how the guy so acts. So sad. But he doesn't drive around talking like that, like, hey, brother, get out of the way, you know? Uh, so it's like that's the, where they're turning on their personas, so that mm. seems like that's the place for warmth, yeah. right? Oh. Right, that, that's where that, the action happens. So. Yeah, yeah. See, that's great. I think that's awesome. Like, so there's some color theory going on in Nightmare yeah. Pro Wrestling. Another yeah. reason to pick that book apart. Uh, <laughs> Or or up or, uh, <laughs> but I, I mean like yeah. re- read it to enjoy it, but also read it to study it. Study it, yes. yes. <laughs> it's like pick it apart. Sounds a little, you know, like oh, Mister Gear, uh, you did this <laughs> wrong and that wrong. Yeah, no, <laughs> don't send in that email, everybody. The internet's full of those guys. Uh, I actually, I actually posted it, totally off topic, but I actually posted a somebody's wrong on the internet post on Twitter yesterday and I was like, <laughs> oh, I was that guy. Yeah. <laughs> but it needed it needed correcting, but I was that guy. <laughs> <laughs> was it because of the whole Disney Star Wars thing? Tell no, me it, it wasn't. Was not. Okay, good. No, it was Thank not. you. So anyway, uh, so uh John, did you have a chance to think about any comics that you'd recommend as like scary comics uh, to read today? Yeah, uh I have some. Um one that I wish I had with me, but I don't is uh the Bernie Wrightson adaption of Creep Show. Oh, oh yeah, okay. yeah. Oh, yeah, that's one of my favorites. I just love uh, Bernie Wrightson's like artwork. He tends to bring out that creepiness. Yeah. <laughs> well, and his Frankenstein, yeah, oh yeah, right. Jaws. Right. incredible. That one's really good. Yeah. Even his, um, his his Spider-Man graphic novel Hooky had like a lot of horror elements in it. Do you guys ever read that? No, I've, see, I've no? seen it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's got like blob monsters with eyeballs and horns and fangs and everything. But the thing about Wrightson, I don't know. If, can you describe like what it is that he does in his artwork that makes it look? Because I know what you're talking about. But it, it, there's just something he does that makes things seem like him and um, it's Wrightsony. Wrightsony, yeah. I know <laughs> what it is. It what is it? You know, like Steve Bissett is another one of those guys who could do that too. They can make something look really eerie and creepy. I'm wondering if we can pin what that is. I think it's uh, almost like the grotesqueness of like his lines, almost like uh, even like his humans always look like a little bit like not human. I don't know mm-hmm. how to describe it. Like mm-hmm. almost like a little bit more grotesque. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, it's like it's like they're like amplified by virtue of the amount of detail and like the kind of like elongated, rubbery way he makes people look. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah. I don't know if you can bring it up on the on the, the comic cam. I don't know if it'll work with the. With we can try. Display. Matt, can we get? Can we try getting this uh, iPad image? Oh, yeah. hey! It's showing. Look at that, Doc Macab. So is this Wrightson? Yeah, this is Wrightson. He. Uh, just two or three years ago, did it? Yeah. With um, the yeah, and there's something in like the feathering he uses, and like the the black placement that he uses. Well, he's very good with with his contrasts. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah, and, yeah and, and again, it does get back to that atmospheric. He he's he's really brilliant at conjuring atmosphere with with his. But yeah, work. even his normal people look like there's something. Scary about, about them. <laughs> yeah. Like like you know they're the the but, you know the the really tall. Butler or something like that. Uh-huh. Uh, their faces are just a little longer than they need to be, and yeah, a little and more wrinkled than they need to be. Yeah, also are like amplified a little bit. Yeah. Like, yeah. In the well, so I'm, I'm just noticing like this this character here has got the uh, 
uh, you know, uh, whoops, extra lean, fa- you know, very angular, very lean, o- almost, mm-hmm. you know, uh, kind of face. And that, you know, that always yeah. sort of conjures images of of disease or ill health. <laughs> <laughs> like you, you, Carol Stroykin, I think, he, he played the... Um he was on the Adams family. He was Lurch on the Adams family, and he was the giant in Twin Peaks. Yep. Um, and he was on. Oh, 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 you mean Lurch in the Adams family movie? Yes. Yeah. Like, yeah. No, yeah. That's, that's Ted Cassidy. No, 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 no. no. The, yeah, the Ad- yeah, the Adams family <laughs> movie, <laughs> oh, where where he he seems just a little too tall and a little too skinny, and his face is just a little too angular. It's, it's not completely going back out of to the, realm. the difference between disturbing and horrifying. Right. right. Disturbing yeah. is like there's something off here, yeah. and so maybe rights and stuff is a little bit disturbing. Right. Yeah. He, yeah. he can do both. He, yeah. He, but he, he. And then he can bring out the monsters with the you know the stuff going all over the right, place. Right. Yeah. Right. Uh, uh, have you guys ever wait, checked out? I was gonna say we oh. should check and see if John has more because he only yeah. got one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> um. Yeah. Uh. We we're talking about uh, manga earlier and uh, Uzumaki. I don't know if you guys have uh seen that manga it's right here man oh, he's got, one, yeah. he's got it too so he's we got, got the, the second volume camp. so go ahead and talk about it john while we put it on the comic camp yeah uh it's it's about a, a girl that returns to her hometown and her hometown uh it's like overrun by these spiral shapes and everybody in the town starts going crazy because of oh, these weird. spiral shapes and they kind of get like possessed by it in a way Yikes. and i know it sounds like a little yeah. goofy but if you read the, yeah. the it's, manga it's it doesn't like, look goofy it <laughs> no it's sometimes. <laughs> it's like this crazy concept which shouldn't work and does just wonderfully yeah 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 it's like a simple concept and they just take it to like a, a horrific place people's bodies like, uh, changing and it's got know. beautiful uh, in it yeah. too. postulating slug people yeah yeah <laughs> that's so thank and, you and it's also like it's it's anytime where, <laughs> pleasant dreams uh, the artwork is just like you know like beautiful like manga artwork and then as it starts to get to the more horrific parts it's like amplified and super detailed and you're like whoa <laughs> yeah <laughs> please stop now so this yeah. is Uzumaki by Junji Ito. Junji Ito. So that'll be linked in the show notes as well. Go to your local library today, everybody, and check this book out if you want to be freaked out. <laughs> um, we got Erin Helmrich waiting to come in here with her book recommendations. So um, I want to. Can I squeak in a couple more? Yes, just please. Before. Please. I, I, oh, um, Thirty Days of Night. Simply because Steve Niles was brilliant enough to go. Hey, there are places where the sun does not rise for a long period of time and let's set a vampire story there. <laughs> it was just a brilliant yeah. concept and then just horrendously rendered. Yeah. Um, the atmosphere in that one's pretty great. It is. Yeah. It is. And and um and then actually uh Revival by oh, yeah, uh, Tim Seeley and Mike Norton. Mm. Uh it's uh, people start coming back from the dead but not like zombies. Mm. They're they're just back and no one knows what to do and it's set in like rural Wisconsin so there's nice kind of American gothic sort of feel to it hmm. um and then uh um anathema by um uh, rachel deering which is a werewolf uh saga set in the 17 1700s 18th century then um and uh just uh, there's there's werewolf lore there's kind of lovecraftian overtones just hmm. really good stuff so Okay. Well, and then I also wanted to point out the um, the Ray Bradbury Chronicles, the comic series, oh, yeah? and oh, yeah. Dave Gibbons did some of it. Now, Dave Gibbons is not a guy that I would look at and go like, "Oh, his stuff is horrifying," but when he did the adaptation of some of uh, of Bradbury's more scarier stories, like uh, "Come Down into the Cellar," do you guys remember that one where the kids mm-hmm. do all the mail aways to get mushrooms uh, in the mail? They grow mushrooms in their basement, and it turns out the mushrooms are actually aliens uh, that are taking <laughs> over the minds of the people of the town, and it ends with. The dad being the last guy who's not taking over, and his son is saying, "Come on down to the cellar. Come on down to the cellar." And he goes because he knows that there's no, there's no place to go. Right? right? Might as well just <laughs> just uh, acquiesce to the situation. Yeah. And that's one of those horror stories that ends just dreadfully. Uh, but Gibbons does such a good job making that story mm-hmm. just even that much more frightening. So I'd recommend looking for those as well. Um, okay, so we got to switch out. Aaron Helmrich is here. So I guess Dave. I'm sorry to say. You get ejected. I get ejected. All right. No. <laughs> <laughs> See, so, that's why I picked the, so, this. Ah, this, so this the Dave ground. Carter of yet another comics blog dot blogspot dot com. Yep. Dave reads comics on the Twitters and um, uh, 
occasionally here. So th- <laughs> yeah, thank we'll, you we'll for We'll have you back me. again yeah. soon uh, to talk more about Mini Comics Day coming up uh, in just a few months. Yeah, it's Mar- March seems like a long ways away, but it really isn't. It, it really it isn't. Is. And we'll talk more about Mini Comics Day and then also some other things that we've got cooking up for the area. So Excellent. Thank you for being here, Dave. Yep, thank uh, you all. You go into Thanks, the control Dave. room and actually p- chime in if you want. There's a microphone in there where you can join us uh, in the conversation sort of remotely as a uh, disembodied voice. So, but now... Which, terribly appropriate for this time of year. That's right. <laughs> but just make sure that you, Dave, when you're coming in, you have to be going, ooh. Okay, and now I'm going to make my point. Ooh. Like that. Uh, so, Aaron Helmrick, the graphic novel selector of the Ann Arbor District Library. Hello. So... Good to see you. Good to see you. Well, I was going to bring... What well, wait, I thought you'd be in a costume. It's I Halloween. Know. Well, I get to be behind the scenes this year for the first time, so uh, I kind of took a break. I normally am down in the trenches with the toddlers on st- Halloween, so... Ooh. Now I'm, that I'm is I'm taking scary. a vacation <laughs> break, <laughs> a costume break. Um, but if you guys talked about I know it's technically not a graphic novel, but it is timely because it's one of the books out there, um, Scary Stories Tell in the Dark. By, with Stephen Gamble's illustrations. Do you, are you familiar with that I've, one? I've heard Basically, it. it's yeah. an awesome book of scary stories, but that wouldn't be as popular as it was for the past 25 years, and they just reissued the anniversary issue and switched out the illustrations. Mm-hmm. And um, I can't remember. I think it's Brett, the guy who illustrated the um, series of unfortunate events, took it over. Oh. Mm. Anyway, I tried to find a copy. I couldn't find it. I could show you the awesome illustrations, but... I just brought along what are my favorite, technically not horror, but true crime. Um, I'm a big fan of Rick Geary's books Mm -hmm. and all of his, you know, true crime murder stories. So a different take on on that, but um, definitely um, for people who want to still read gruesome stuff. (laughs) <laughs> but in a slightly more documentarian I, I, way. I, I seem to remember talking about this before. The Beast of Chicago is about that dude who built a hotel with all the torture yes. chambers. Yes, and that devil in the White City was is the same yep. person. He also went to U of M. Um, he was here <laughs> oh, at, at the medical school before, so he was learning some of his so uh, he's a local tips and boy. tricks. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And yeah. he became the first American, documented American serial killer. Exactly. Way to go. Well, ex- <laughs> right exactly. at Arbor. <laughs> um, and then, of course, Jack the Ripper. But the Bloody Benders is a really gruesome and interesting story. A group of people in the middle of the prairie who would um, have people come in and get readings, you know, kind of, you know, psychic. do psychic yeah. readings or whatnot, but in front of a curtain, and then somebody behind the curtain would hit them in the head with a hammer. But the interesting <laughs> thing about this book is that um, apparently Laura Ingalls Wilder even talked about the Bloody Benders like back in the day, because, you know, it was oh. in the time, a lot of these are in the time when it took a long time to figure out someone was missing, because yeah. there's no phones, no, no you know. No GPS kids. <laughs> Isolation. Yeah, which is yeah, exactly isolated. the case in this. The girls go away to the big city and don't come back, and no one comes looking for them for a long time. So, yeah. But anyway, wow. those are some of my favorite true crimes and... A lot of the good stuff that I was going to so bring up was checked out, which is a good thing. Yeah, well, that is a good thing. Rick Geary is the yeah. one to check out. So let me ask you, uh, since you weren't here at the top of the episode, favorite costume you ever wore on Halloween? Oh, um, two. My mother made a really awesome Raggedy Ann costume for me in kindergarten, like turned a wool hat into a wig. Yeah. And then also Scarecrow. Oh, you know, wow. Like, you know, turn the um, overalls with straw and all that kind of good stuff. Yeah, I think those were... Mm-hmm. I actually have a hilarious picture up. Um, it's not my favorite costume, but it's the favorite Halloween picture of me with a cold looking miserable dressed as Dracula with a turtleneck on because it was hu- cold out, <laughs> but with my two friends dressed as slutty um, valley girls. Wait, 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 this was is this? 1985, so oh, okay. they're both you know, wearing their striped you know, <laughs> red <laughs> lips and, and hachi chachi, and I was a miserable Dracula. Uh, well, the best memories <laughs> are the ones that where we had a yes. really bad time for some reason, right? I mean, that's well, another reason we like I, I I don't know. It's, you know with, the, with the turtleneck, you're like 70s Dracula. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yes. <laughs> exactly. Uh, Eli, actually, uh, Ulotricus on the Twitters is piping in. That he's, uh, he, uh, speaking of Richard Sala earlier, he says his story, Dark and Silly Night, written by Lemony Snicket, is another good one to check out. So there, there's another book recommendation. So we are at the bottom of the, the half hour. So it's time to wrap this guy up. Holy so. smokes. I know it goes fast, doesn't it? I didn't even get to talk about how, you know, why zombies are so popular now. 
Well, maybe want to do a zombie episode we uh, could in do, the near we future? Could do that, we yeah. should do a zombie episode because we can go into the whole thing about uh, John. I just want to ask John this because who yeah. knows when we'll get to talk to him again. Uh, running zombies, lumbering zombies. I need your opinion on this. This is how I judge my friends. Uh, lumbering zombies. Hey, he's a good guy. Yeah. <laughs> Although I'll I'll go I'll go for my usual. Uh, of course, they're not really zombies. They're not and all oh, the, the popular. The n- no, all of the popular zombies are not really zombies. They're uh, they're you know. really ghouls. Because uh, <laughs> zombies don't me. eat human flesh. They're they're that's they eat brains. No, they don't. Uh, no, no, no. They they're you know if you go back to the uh, Afro Caribbean myth of the zombie. From, uh, is I read the Donald Duck comic about it. Yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it, they, they have, you know they have nothing to do with with gnawing on on human flesh. Well, Night of the Living Ghouls. But I'm gonna I'm gonna le- yeah I that I I know <laughs> we've we've read redefined zombies and that's yeah. and that's okay. Okay, but but anyway, but I agree with John. Lumbering zombies <laughs> way better. Shambling, I like. Yeah, that. shambling. The <laughs> shambling zombie is way way cooler because then it's the building suspense and dread. Oh, see, there you go. Yeah, whereas uh, the running zombie is jump scare. Ah, yeah, yeah. Oh, come on, <laughs> a dog could do that. Yeah. Hey, look, they're over there. No, they're here. <laughs> right. <laughs> but when you see them in the distance and they're coming, and then there's nothing, and there's no way to yeah, and they're not gonna get tired, but you're gonna get tired. That's dread, right? So that's my. I, I don't remember uh, who it was that described it as like uh, that repre- that kind of zombie representing death. Mm. How it's you know keep trying to get away from it, but it's coming after you, mm. coming after you, coming after you, and eventually it's gonna get you. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I think that's a great way to put it. So. Okay, cool. Well, that was a fun discussion. I had fun. I hope you guys did, too. I hope everybody at home had fun. This will be archived at comicsagreat.com slash CAG67. It will be on youtube.com slash comicsagreat. It will be on comics.adl.org. That's all the places you can go to get this fine entertainment. If you enjoyed it, I'm going to ask. I don't do this every time. Uh, go to iTunes, give it a star review, or give a thumbs up on the YouTube video. That would help raise our visibility to other people who may enjoy this as well. And don't forget to, to check out the links in the show notes at comicsagreat.com slash CAG67. AG67. Paul, good to see you. (laughs) Good to see you. Happy Halloween. Happy Halloween to you. What are you doing tonight? I am probably just going to watch some uh, horror movies all by myself. What one are you going to watch? Actually, you know what? No, I'm going to probably watch the new episode of Supernatural, which is like a little horror story, horror movie every week. Good choice. It's got that good looking guy. Have you guys seen uh, the cartoon Gravity Falls? Yes. I've heard good things about it. I haven't seen it yet. That show's amazing. Yeah, I love that show. Yeah, I would uh, suggest to watch the the Summerween episode. Summerween Summer episode Ween of episode. Okay. so yeah, Gravity Falls. I was just at a comic convention this past weekend. I was at Detroit Fan Fair and I was doing free sketches for kids, uh, representing kids read comics there. And the number one thing I was asked to draw was Grunkle Stan. And so it's all these ten year old girls like draw me Grunkle Stan. And the parents are all going like, Why does my kid want a picture of an old man with a fez? I don't get it. <laughs> <laughs> What's, like, a <grunkle? laughs> What's a Grunkle? What's a Grunkle? But yeah, I, I I think I drew like twenty or thirty Grunkle stands, and I started getting kind of tired of it, so I started drawing Grunkle Stan as the Hulk, Grunkle Stan as an Ewok. And <laughs> they still were flying off the table. So, Gravity Falls, great yes. recommendation. Everybody should watch that show. Anybody who enjoys good entertainment. What scary movie are you gonna watch tonight, John? Uh, I'm gonna introduce my wife to an old B movie called Spider Baby. Oh. oh, I've not seen that. So what's it about? Yeah, it's a it's kind of like about a. Uh, deranged kind of family with uh, Lon Chaney Jr. as like the head of the household pretty much. Mm-hmm. It's kind of more like a, a deranged Adams family sort of thing. Yeah. Disturbing. And didn't, yeah. didn't I think <laughs> uh, uh, didn't that uh, inspire Rick Beach's uh, imprint? Isn't that Spider Baby? Oh. Uh-huh. And then uh, and my, uh, my friend Terrence Greep who is a wrestler um, uh, goes by the Nom de ring, spider baby. <laughs> spider baby. <laughs> awesome. Uh, Aaron Helmrich, what scary movie would would you uh, recommend that somebody watch? If I tonight? could, I would be watching them with the giant ants. Oh, nice. Uh, that's a good one. Oh. Yep. Yeah, that's good too. Ends with <laughs> flamethrowers and giant ants. Always good for a fun time. Because they oh. couldn't figure out a way to make the giant <laughs> magnifying glass work. <laughs> Uh, I would, I would, I would recommend uh, Magic uh, with Anthony Hopkins. Oh, that is a horrible, horrible film. That is it's great. Yeah, that yeah. is a terrifying <laughs> movie. It's ventriloquist dummies. That's the scariest thing ever. And Anthony Hopkins is a ventriloquist dummy. And we're just Meredith being murdered by a ventriloquist dummy. 
very oh, scary. Give a spoiler. That's not a spoiler. That's that, that doesn't even tell you about like the the great love making scene with Anne Margaret <laughs> and the ventriloquist dummy <laughs> and the ventriloquist dummy in the other room getting jealous while the harmonica music plays. Oh, <laughs> that movie's so freaky. It is. I I tried watching it once by myself to confront my fears and I couldn't make it all I the think, way through. Uh, it and then, you know, and a movie that I can't watch anymore is The Hunger. Oh, it's I don't just think so. That. Talk about disturbing. Yeah. It's just that whole thing throughout is just like, oh, I feel dirty watching. Uh, uh. Um, and it's not, you know, not because of the sex or whatever. It's just that uh, there's just some element that they just do a wonderful job of conveying that this is just wrong. Oh. So. Fun. All right. Well, hey, I hope everybody has a spooky Halloween and uh, not too spooky. You know, it's the safe spooky, the Halloween spooky. And so then uh, the spookiest guy on the block is none other than Paul Story. Where can we find more about you? Uh, you can find me at Storyville.com, Storyville on the Twitters, Paul D. Story on Facebook. And uh, if I ever remember it, uh, Quest for Success uh, on Live Journal. Oh. Are <laughs> people still using that? I. I forget. Oh. <laughs> I, I forget all the time. <laughs> Live Journal. Uh, yeah. So, okay, Quest for Success at Live Journal, and then my, that's well, where. Uh, by the way, it's Quest with the number four success. Oh, so. very Web 2.0. Yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> or Web 1.5 <laughs> yeah. or something like that. Uh, and then, and so, Storyville.com is where you can find My Boyfriend is a Monster and the Twisted Journey Journey's series, books. and not Werewolf by Night because Paul didn't write those. Sadly, I did not write that. He just got I, scared. By I did them. have a werewolf story <laughs> in Moonstone Monsters, Werewolves, um, and uh, a zombie story. If you collect, get the uh, Moonstone Monsters uh, uh, trade paperback collection, <laughs> that's got uh, that's got a werewolf story in there. Love so werewolves. do a blog post on all these things where we can find them on storyville.com, please. I'll, I'll, I'll try and do that. And we'll endeavor yeah. to do so. So, John. Where can we find you? Yeah. Uh, NightmareProWrestling.com and John, John David Guerra on the Twitters. Or John David Guerra. <laughs> you don't have to roll those R's. <laughs> if, if you're a whitey like me, that See, is John I, David Guerra. I can, I can cheat a little because yeah. I've got Scottish background, so our rolling is not uh, completely unknown to us. Yeah, well. So. <laughs> But, uh, but yes, so John David Guerra on the Twitters. Follow him. He's on Google Plus, too. He posts all sorts of awesome stuff there. Uh, that's where you can find some of the awesome <laughs> there's stuff. There's still people on Google Plus? Uh, there's a lot of people on Google Plus. I, I think it's pretty, I gotta remember to post there, it's too. It's pretty rad. I like yeah. it. <laughs> uh, but <laughs> touche. Aaron, uh, I know you had to step out for a second, but uh, any place where we can find you, just AADL.org, comics. That. Gory Girl on Twitter is where you can follow Aaron. So, nice. yes. Uh, yeah, G-O-R-E-Y-G-I-R-L. So you're back to tweeting. Ah, so that's where you can uh, follow up and pester, harangue, and otherwise bother Aaron Helmrich, everybody. So thanks once again to the Ann Arbor District Library for putting on this show every couple weeks. Thanks to Matt Dubay, Eric Kloster, Tom Smith, uh, Eli Nyberger for helping to make this show possible and, uh, and letting me use the studio space. Thanks to Paul Story for hanging out with me. John, great to meet you finally face-to-face. Yeah, thanks. nice to meet you too. Thanks to Dave Carter, uh, Dave Reads Comics on the Twitters, and to Aaron Helmrich. And thanks, everybody, for watching and listening. Until next time, uh, I have been... What? I was going to say, as Sir Greg Gasly used to say, Happy haunting. <laughs> <laughs> okay, bye. <laughs>